my name is Todd Lane, and I've spent a lot of time working on Postgres Query Planner, and I'm looking for some help. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I might even get some, judging by the number of faces here. So this talk is meant to encourage people to look at the planner code by giving you a kind of 10,000 foot overview of what it does, why it does it. I'm not going, it's not going to be a substitute for actually reading the code by any means, but what I'd like to do is give you enough context so that you can make sense of what you're reading when you're looking at it. Um, another way to explain this talk is that it's an attempt to answer a question that Robert posed in email, which was what are the major phases of planning in phases of processing in the planner. I'm going to cover some other material as well, but a lot of it comes directly from this question. So here's the outline of the talk. Um, I'm going to start with some background material that hopefully won't be news to many of you. And then we'll get into the meat of the talk. I'm going to spend most of the time talking about code structure, but there are a couple other things that I think deserve mention. So as a reminder, there are four key subsystems that are involved in the execution of any SQL query. We've got the parser, which determines the semantic meaning of the query string. We've got the rewriter, which performs view and rule expansion. We've got the planner, which designs an execution plan for the query. And then we've got the executor, which actually runs that plan to produce the query's results. So you've probably heard all that before, but before we move on, there's an interesting point about these subsystems. The parser, the rewriter, and the executor all have very, very well-defined responsibilities. Given a particular input query and a particular database contents, there's only one right output for those guys. On the other hand, the planner's task is a whole lot fuzzier because there can be many valid plans for the same query, and it's not always clear which one is best. So the planner's responsibilities look like this. It's got to find a good query plan, and it's got to not spend too much time or memory finding it. Um, so in this context, good does not necessarily mean best. In particular, it's not going to be helpful if we spend more time finding a slightly better plan that is going to be saved at execution by using a slightly better plan. So planning time is always a consideration anytime you're thinking about something you would like a planner to do. The other major constraint on what we're doing is that we need to support the extensible aspects of Postgres. We've got custom data types and custom operators and functions to go along with them. And so that constrains what we can know and it means that hardwired knowledge in the planner is generally a bad thing, particularly if it's about specific data types and operators. There are a lot of things that would be easier if we could hardwire knowledge, but anytime we do that, we're losing some support for extensions, so it's best to avoid it. Um, and I hope this slide is not news to any of you, but just as a reminder, a plan is a tree of plan nodes, each one representing some specific processing step. At execution, that node is going to yield a stream of tuples, which are either the actual output of the query or data being passed up to a higher level query. <coughs> Relation scan nodes, of course, will get their tuples directly from a table. Most other node types are reading input from a child plan node and processing some have been somehow to produce their own output stream. So there are a bunch of different types of plan nodes, and here I've listed the most important ones. I'm not going to sit here and read the list to you, but I do want to point out that a listed nest loop within our index scan is a separate plan type, which may seem a little surprising because the executor certainly doesn't think that. But it turns out that it is quite different for the, from, for the planner, as we'll see later on. Um, and a plan node has got some attributes that pretty much all plan nodes have these. There's a data source, which can be a relation to scan, if it's a table scan. Maybe there's also an indication of what index to use for that. Um, if it's a processing node, like say a sort step, then it's going to have a child plan node that provides its input. Or if it's a join node, it will have two children that provide the input to be joined. And it's also got a target list, and if you think select list, you need to know all you need to know about that. Uh, the target list specifies the values that will appear in the rows emitted by that plan node. And then in many plan nodes, we'll have selection conditions which are also called qualifiers of just calls, and their think where clause, you know, that does, it filters out rows that don't satisfy the condition. So whatever comes out of the 
uh, plan that was expected to satisfy that condition. You know, there are also some estimates that the planner makes for each plan, though. These should look pretty familiar to you if you've ever seen them explain output. But, uh, we need to estimate the output row count because we will need that in making estimates for any higher level joins that happen. Um, we estimate the average row width because if we're going to have to figure out how much workspace might be needed for a sort or a cache above that node, we're going to need a product of those two numbers. And of course, the total cost is the thing we're trying to minimize. So of course we would like to know that. And, but on the other hand, if there's a limit in, above this, then total cost isn't actually quite the right number. Because total cost to the planner means what would it cost to run this node to completion. And if there's a limit above it, we in fact are not going to run it to completion. And so what we want also is a startup cost so we can interpolate and figure out what the true cost of doing that is going to be. Okay, that's enough for review. Let's get into the main part of the talk. And I already told you what that was going to be, but first I want to mention some terminology that you'll find all over the planner code. In fact, I found out I couldn't write this talk without using it. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so a var or variable is a table called reference. No great magic there, but you know that's what it is. Uh, a relation is a real table or perhaps only a virtual table that's formed as the output of the plan node. Uh, a base relation is primitive from item, which most commonly is an actual table, but it could be a subquery that the planner's current level is treating as a black box, or it could be something like a set returning function. Um, a join relation is the result of joining a specific set of join, of, sorry, specific set of base relations. The aim of the planner is to produce a join rel containing all the base rels in the query. But we have to work up to, to that by considering join rels that contain just subsets of the base rels. And I'll be talking a lot more about that in a bit. And last, a join qual is a qualifier that uses vars from more than one base relation, which means that we have to apply it at, as part of forming a join. We can't apply it to either base relation individually. So now the phases of planning, there are four main flavors. Four main phases in my mind. We've got pre processing, which is all about simplifying query to the extent that it can, and it also collects information about the query that we'll be using in the later steps. Then the core part of the planner is scan join planning, which is basically about implementing the from and where parts of a select query. And then the special <coughs> feature handling deals with everything that's not from or where. And then lastly, we have some post processing which doesn't really make any interesting decisions. It just converts the plan into the form that the executor will need to run it. Um, so here are some of the key things we do during early pre-processing. We simplify scalar expressions. We expand simple SQL functions in line. And we simplify the join tree, which is the parser's representation of the queries from clause. And I'll show examples of each of those in a moment. Because this stuff is happening early in pre-processing, we don't yet have very much information about the query. So this can't do anything that depends on cost estimates or anything very fancy. All these transformations of things that pretty much things that have got to be guaranteed to be wins because we're going to apply them blindly. So we don't get into making choices that are based on cost-based comparison of different alternatives until we get into the main scan and join phase. And the reason why this stuff is done before we've collected any interesting information is that these steps will affect the information that we want to collect. So in particular, simplifying the join tree can result in changing the set of relations we're going to consider. So that is something we really need to do first. Um, Simplifying expressions is pretty simple in principle. What we know how to do is essentially constant folding, which means that we pre-evaluate any immutable operator or function whose inputs are all constants. And we do that recursively, so it can go up. So for example, if we see 2 plus 2, we can apply the addition operator, and we get 4. In this more <laughs> complicated example, we first see 2 plus 2, and we apply that and get 4. Now we have 4 equals 4, 
and we execute that and we get true. And now we realize that the case is always going to select its first uh, alternative. So we throw everything else away and we just have the first branch. And uh, now x plus 1, we can't simplify anymore this way, so we're done. Um, we have to be careful not to evaluate things that couldn't get evaluated at runtime. So it's, in this example, it's important that we not pre-simplify 1 over 0. Um, if you had a bare 1 over 0 somewhere in the query that wasn't protected by a case like that, then indeed that is going to fail during constant folding. You know, we generally figure that that's okay because it will fail anyway at runtime. Uh, although occasionally there are